studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. For five years, Vanessa Leggett has been conducting interviews for a book about the murder of a Houston socialite. On July 20, 2001, she was jailed for refusing to give up her materials to the government. The 168 days she spent in a federal detention center is by far the longest jail term in U.S. history for a journalist who has refused to turn over her work. The New York Times has called her incarceration, quote, a brazen assault on First Amendment values and the public interest in a free press. Released from jail, she's being honored with the 2002 Penn Newman's own First Amendment ward. I am pleased to have her on this program to talk about uh, this remarkable thing that has happened to her, not only her courage, but the story that she was working on that led her to uh, this conflict. Welcome. Thank you. Good, good. Congratulations on this award, first Thank of all. Thank you. Um, tell me what happened. I mean, what, what led you to be incarcerated for those who have not read your story? Well, I was conducting interviews about a story that happened in Houston involving a man who was accused of having his wife killed. <clears throat> and he was being pursued by the federal government. The federal government found out that I had been interviewing a number of people, and so they came to me to ask if I would talk to them and become an informant in the end. Informant? Yeah, to become an informant um, to help them with their investigation. And I refused to, you know, become a paid informant or sign their contract or anything, and that sort of created friction between us. And uh, they ended up subpoenaing all of my interviews, including originals and copies of any tape-recorded interviews that I had made. And I couldn't even keep a copy for myself for my own use. And they served me this sweeping subpoena, uh, asking me to surrender, in essence, my entire research archives. And that would leave me, from a, a journalist perspective, without any proof or, or anything to substantiate the work that I had done. And I just I knew it was wrong. I refused to cooperate, and they placed me in jail. And said, you'll stay here until you turn over those records? That's correct. They said um, that you are to be held without bail for a term of 18 months of the term of the grand jury until you cooperate. Tell me about Roger Angleton. Roger Angleton was allegedly hired by Bob Angleton to kill Bob Angleton's wife, Doris. And I interviewed Roger Angleton uh, for numerous hours. And Roger Angleton was um, being held in jail with his brother, Bob, for the crime. While they were awaiting trial, Roger Angleton turned up dead in his jail cell. And the police found out that I had interviewed Roger and they subpoenaed all of my taped interviews with Roger. That's what they really wanted. Yes, that's right. And, there, you know, there was no other way for them to uh, obtain the information um, because Roger was dead. And that was one of the problems I had with the request that they made, of, that the FBI made of me, because they were asking me for taped interviews with people that they had talked to themselves, people that had testified before the grand jury, or people that they had access to that they could find out their own information without taking mine. You said one time, the case picked me, I didn't pick it. Mm -hmm. Meaning the case involving you and, and your, um, your sense of, of professional responsibility not to turn over right. the interview. Right. I mean, there's, there are certain burdens that must be met, that should be met by the government. Um, there are occasions, I suppose, where journalists should have to cooperate, and that is when the government can show that what they're seeking is material or relevant to their case, that it's specific, in other words, they're asking for a particular interview with a particular person, and third, and I think most importantly, that the information that they're seeking is not obtainable from other sources because the press should be approached as a last resort. If they can get the information elsewhere, they should. So in instances where they can show that the material is essential to, the, to making their case, they're specific in the request. In my case, they were asking for everything. And that it can't be obtained from other sources, they might have to surrender the information. But those, those burdens should be met. And in my case, none of them were. And case law shows that all of them should be, not just one, but all three. When you went inside the jail, you thought you'd be there for how long? 
I didn't know. I know what the judge's order said. 18 months. 18 months of the term of the grand jury. Because grand juries are conducted in secrecy, I really didn't know um, what kind of term I would be facing. And I, I think in large part that's why the government came after me also is because of the grand jury secrecy. They didn't think anyone would find out what was going on. They thought I would just surrender the information and no one would know. Then they argued in court that you were not a journalist. Well, they actually didn't argue that in court, but they argued it in the media. That's what I mean. Yeah. The, oh, just in the media. Well, yeah. The, the, interestingly enough, and that was a, a subject of great you know, public debate and interest, understandably, but the courts really didn't address that. My state, Texas, is part of the Fifth Circuit. And in the Fifth Circuit, in the context of a grand jury, the law is that you really can't withhold information because the grand jury has broad investigative powers. Uh, so whether I was a journalist or not was really inconsequential in the, in the context of a grand jury in the Fifth Circuit. So that really um, wasn't an issue. And in fact, the courts did not decide on that. When my case went from the district court and was appealed to the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit justices that heard the case said, we are not going to reach or resolve the issue of whether or not Ms. Leggett is a journalist. If we were, however, and this is just sort of dicta, we would uh, apply a certain test and clearly, I met the test, and the sort of the, the litmus test, if you will, was whether or not the person that, is, that the government seeks information from, at the inception of their news gathering process, whether or not they were intending to publish, not whether or not they had published, but intent was the key. And you clearly had intent. Right, and, and the government understood that. In fact, when the FBI first approached me, they said, we understand you're writing a book. Tell me about you. I mean, what is it about you that gave you this great sense of the role of journalism and the great courage you know, to adhere to what was right, notwithstanding the fact that you would be apart from your family and people you loved? I felt great personal conviction in this case. Um, at first, it was a sense of, this is wrong, and it was always that. Why but are they doing this to me? Exactly, and also I could not breach the confidences that people had given me. I, people had taken a chance on me, because I'm not an established journalist. And they had taken a chance by cooperating with me and giving me information and trusting me with that information. And I felt obligated to honor that. When I realized that underlying this was an assault on the First Amendment, it became something much larger than just my sources or just my book. It was about protecting the free flow of information to the public. And it was clear that the government was trying to impede that. Did you ever waver? No, and I know it, it doesn't sound real. It, it seems almost unhuman to not have second thoughts. But I will tell you, the only time I wavered was before I went to jail. When I went to jail, I didn't waver. I, when I found out from my attorney that I could face up to 18 months, but no longer, I did a lot of thinking, and I thought, if I can make it 18 months, then I'll go. If I can't do that, that I'm not going to go. And once I was resolved in my mind that I could do that, then I knew that I was able to and do it. And how did you resolve that you could do that 18 months? It was just worth it to me. I mean, it was to, to protect my sources and to guard the First Amendment. It was worth it. I, I felt like it was really a small price to pay. Some will argue, as you know, mm -hmm. who don't appreciate the role of journalists necessarily, or who will say there was a terrible victim here mm -hmm. already and that there is a responsibility of a citizen at some point mm -hmm. if they have information about a crime to divulge it. You would say yes, but they've got to meet the test. That's right. And in my case, they clearly did not and could not. Why didn't they meet the test? Because they didn't think that they had to. And ultimately, they didn't. Can you repeat for me what they would have had to do to meet the test? 
first they would need to show that the material that they're seeking is relevant and essential to the maintenance of their case. Secondly, the material requested has what, to be was specific. Was it relevant? What they were seeking? Yeah, to the maintenance of their case. I. Did you have anything in your interview that would have been relevant to the maintenance of their case? I, I can't really say. Um, I mean, I, I guess it could be broadly interpreted. Courts would have to ultimately decide It's a possibility. That. Yeah. It, Relevance is a possibility. It could be. Okay, but that's something for the courts to decide, and that yeah. wasn't, didn't happen in my case. Okay. Um, specific, specificity? Right. Absolutely not. If you look at the subpoena... They were fishing. Yes, unquestionably. They were asking for any and all interviews, copies and originals of any of these named individuals and anyone else. And what would mm -hmm. they have had to do to satisfy that test of specificity? narrow it to something specific that they were seeking and the reason I something think something that the, this man might have said to you in an interview that sure. would have implicated him or or anyone else, someone else. And, and, but, but clearly they weren't doing that it was a fish, fishing expedition and thirdly that the information is not obtainable from other sources in my case all of these people that they were seeking they either had testified before the grand jury they'd interviewed them or had you know, whatever, they had the same access that I did, and if not better, because they have far more resources. So anything that they would seek from me would be cumulative. And not only that, you know, some, some uh, courts, some cases have found that the information should be admissible as well. So admissibility is a factor. I don't believe that what other parties told me would be admissible. They would need to get it from those parties themselves. And so I think that that's what they should have done, but they didn't. Roger Angleton subsequently committed suicide and he left a note claiming full responsibility? Yes, that's correct. For the murder. What do you think of Roger Angleton? He was a fascinating character. Um, much has been made about um, his um, mental stability. Um, I think what is important for people to know is that that was, according to Roger, part of the plan was for him to appear unstable. Um, I think Roger was a very intelligent man, perhaps too intelligent, uh, and just a fascinating character. It was, it was uh, truly an experience interviewing him. How many days and how, why was it truly an experience? He was just unlike any other subject that I've ever interviewed. And that? Uh, he was very animated uh, and very interesting and interested. He uh, had great stories and anecdotes and uh, was willing also to engage in introspection that for a lot of us would be uncomfortable. Like? Um, looking at his past actions, examining his life. And Why did he tell you all this? I thought a lot about that, naturally. Uh, I think that part of it was he had been carrying all this around inside of him for so long, unable to talk to anyone about it. And I think that he wanted his story to be known. And he trusted me to do that fairly. And so I think part of it was just being able to talk to someone about what had happened because it was so extraordinary and such an experience for any human being to go through and that he wanted it to be documented. He wanted his story to be known. In every way, every detail. I think so. He really, he wanted people to know what he did. Well, he, I think part of it too was not just everybody to know. I think he wanted to work through some things himself and he was able to sort of talk through it with me. In fact, on one occasion before we began an interview, he told the guard who uh, ushered uh, me in, or ushered him in rather, that um, here she is, this is my um, psychoanalyst, my friend, my interviewer, my whatnot. And I, I think I was all of those things to him. July, you went inside the prison, the jail. July? Um, July of... Um, I, I went... You began serving this... Oh, yes, I was thinking of Roger going to jail. No, 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 no. <laughs> right, no, I'm no, sorry. No, no, we didn't That's interview correct. you. I'm now you. That's July. Right. Mm -hmm. What happened in January? Uh, this past January, yeah. I was released. 
That's something I won't forget. Why? It was just after being confined for almost six months, and you know they say that time flies when you're having fun. Well, the converse of that is very much true also because if you're not it having fun, it's awful. So slow. So six months um, seemed a lot longer than that. And after not seeing, you know, not being able to be outside or feel the air outside, uh, being subjected to just artificial light around the clock in an institutionalized environment, just to walk out of that jail and see an expanse of blue sky and, and know that I can walk to any direction down the street and no one can tell me otherwise. It was a great feeling. If you had known what it was like mm -hmm. to experience that, mm -hmm. time moving so slow, artificial light, no freedom, would it have affected your decision at all? No, because I, I, I had a notion about what jail was like because I had been to jails to interview people. I had also taught corrections and taken my students through different prisons. And so I had a pretty good sense, I think, more than most citizens of what jail would be like. And so it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. For example, um, I, I know that in the Texas prison system, I was in the federal prison system, um, if inmates refused to eat their tray of food, meaning jello, steak, corn, what have you, is mixed in a blender and poured into a loaf pan and baked, and they call it the food loaf. So if you refuse to eat, that's all you get is a food loaf. And there's all sorts of abuses um, that go on in the Texas prison system. So it could have been a lot worse. Dehumanizing. Sure. I mean, it was dehumanizing, make no mistake. But uh, knowing what I know now, uh, I, it would not have deterred me at all. How did you get out? Because the term of the grand jury expired. After six months? That's right. It should be noted that a lot of news organizations, including the Associated Press and New York Times, filed briefs on your behalf. How did you get the support of all these news organizations? I have no idea. All I know is that I went to jail and my attorney called, and, or I call my attorney actually, and he said that um, the Society of Professional Journalists was um, thinking about doing something to help out, donating money, yeah. and I was just, I couldn't believe it because I felt so alienated and the government had made me feel alienated by saying, you know, she's not really a journalist, she's a wannabe this and a wannabe that, that I did not anticipate that type of support or that level of support. It was truly, it, it strengthened me greatly. Knowing that somebody cared. And, and knowing that I had the affirmation of, of organizations that, that knew how important this was, and yeah. they knew what I had done, and they supported it. You wrote a piece for Newsweek called, my as I remember, My Principles Landed Me in Jail, or something like that? I, that's what they called it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Obviously, right. don't put the titles on pieces. <laughs> right. right. That, uh -huh. That's a title. Uh -huh. When you got out, you, and, and there you're being honored mm -hmm. here in New York, what is it you think you stand for today in your own mind? What is it that's important for us to know about what happened to you? I think, I think the most important thing for me has been, because all of, all of the media has sort of rallied to my defense, the public has really been the beneficiary because they have learned about the importance of the First Amendment. And I'm very grateful for that. And in fact, I was surprised at the number of people who wrote to me while I was in jail. Normal average citizens, non-journalists, non-lawyers, just, you know, plain old people that understood the value of the First Amendment. And I think that's just wonderful. And that that has emerged from my situation is the greatest reward. What's the status for Robert Angleton? Well, the government is... Um, the brother of... Right. Bob, yeah. Bob Angleton is scheduled to be trial, tried excuse me, in June. Uh, I don't think it's going to, to begin on that date, but that is a scheduled trial date. And what's going to happen to you? I'm going to finish my book. Will you be asked to give up your notes again? I don't know. I do... I have been told that I am on the government's witness list to testify at the trial. But just like I did in jail, I'm just going to take it one day at a time and take whatever comes my way when it comes. 
I mean, you've already cast where you're going to be. In other words, you've already said, you know, you, once you stand on principle, you stand on principle. That's right. And that's as it should be. The book will come out when? Not sure yet. What's the title of the book? Um, I, I really don't know at this point. It's changed, and that happens, of course. Um, so, not sure. And you will do finish the book, and then what? Well, I hope um, write many more books. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for having it's me. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure being here. We'll be right back. <clears throat> Stay with us.